ACR family. I'm so glad that you are joining us this week. Um, just wanted to say that with everything going on, there's so many of us that need um, God's peace, that need um, faith to believe in the truth that He's always working and He's always up to something good. And so we're praying and believing for blessings in your life, uh, for His provision and healing for you. So as we sing this, just lift up faith with us. When I'm in the roughest water, I won't go under, I won't drown. And when I'm in over my head, I know.
Good evening, Forever family. My name is Kelsey. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. I'm in recovery for anger, codependency, and sexual addiction. I'm going to read the 12 steps, and I would like you to join me in reading the biblical principles that goes with each. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7.18. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to do to will and to act according to his good purpose. Philippians 2.13. Step three, we made a decision to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12.1. Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Limitations 340. Step five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5, 16. Step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of characters. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. James 4, 10. Step seven, we humbly asked him to remove all our shortcomings. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Step 8. We made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6, 31. Step 9. We made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Step 10. We continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, we promptly admitted it. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Step 11. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16 Step 12. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others, both and practice these principles in all our affairs. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore them gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Galatians 6.1 Welcome to CR First NLR Online. We are excited that you have chosen to join us tonight. This is a safe place where it's okay to not be okay. And if this is your first time to attend CR, we're, first of all, we're very, very excited to have you here. Um, what I'd like you to do for me is if you will email me at lmason at firstnlr.com, I'll send you a card as well as some information about Celebrate Recovery. I think you'll find that this is a very safe place where it is okay to not be okay. After this service, we're going to be having our online open share groups. Now, We've been getting great feedback on these groups since we started them. We have several gender-specific and issue-specific groups, so there is something for everyone. And if you haven't done so already, there's an online form that's on our Facebook page. If you'll do me a favor, simply click on it, fill that out, and then your leader will send you an invite. They'll actually send a link to your group, including a password so that you can get into the group. At 8 p.m. promptly tonight, the groups will start. 
you'll have at least 15 to 20 minutes between large group and open share groups. Make sure that you join us for open share groups. Well, I want to thank you for continuing to support CR First NLR. In fact, there are many of you that are, are already giving online. Many are also doing text to give. And we are so appreciative of this. Um, the last couple weeks, I've been teaching you a little bit on how to give while we're not able to give in person. And I've, I, I wanted to share with you this, uh, the next easy way that you can support CR First and LR. Now, you can give by mailing a check, of course. Um, you can also give securely online by going to firstnlr.com front slash giving or you can use text to give. Now, let me sh just share with you how easy it is to text to give. First, text the keyword CR and the amount that you want to give to 501-238-3700. You must put a space between CR and then the amount you're giving. So what you do is if, if you were giving $10, it would be CR, then a little space, and then $10. You'll receive a reply text with a link to, go in, to, to log into firstnlrsecuregive.com with your account. Then you click on the link and you follow the directions. It's very simple to follow. When you, then you'll log in to your Secure Give account and set up an account if you don't already have one. After that, you'll receive a text confirming your donation. You're going to simply confirm it with a Y for yes or an N for no. And finally, you'll receive a final text stating that your phone is authorized to use text to give and your transaction has been successfully accepted. It's just that simple. Your faithful giving allows us to continue to minister to those struggling with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And as you give tonight, I want to pray for you. Lord, I thank you for faithful, faithful givers here at CR First and LR. And Lord, I pray that as they give tonight, Lord, that you will abundantly bless them in many, many ways in their lives, God. I pray that during this time where, when we're separated, they'll realize the promises that you've given them. And Lord, I pray that they will enjoy the, the fruits of, of following you, Jesus. We love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you as you give. When the advice to not meet in groups of 10 or more was first communicated, my initial response was, this will never work for people in recovery. I've been around the rooms of recovery off and on for the last 39 years, and I've been taught from the beginning that isolation is simply catastrophic for people like me in recovery. And every sponsor that I've ever had would constantly tell me, you cannot stay sober on your own. I was told I needed to surround myself around people that were like me, people in recovery, people who understood my plight. You know, at first I balked and I thought I was different. I knew better. But after several relapses, which were failed attempts at doing recovery my way, I finally submitted fully to the process and I did it their way, meaning my sponsor's way. I listened. I took the advice from those with much more experience than I had. And sure enough, I started stringing together days, and days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and soon I had years. And their methods have worked for me now for the last 17 years. Spending time with people who are in recovery works. And I've learned that I can't do it in isolation. A good friend of mine, I love this saying that he has. He says, I need people in order to live. And this is especially true during a critical situation like we're in right now. You might be asking yourself, well, how does a person work recovery during this time of social distancing? Is it even possible? And if so, what does this kind of sober life look like? Well, believe it or not, you can stay connected and involved in your recovery while social distancing. In fact, I would argue that you must stay connected. Otherwise, you'll most likely return to familiar yet very unhealthy behaviors. Now, my goal tonight is to get you to think outside of the box. 
and really engage in the process of being socially connected while socially distancing. The first step to working your recovery while social distancing is get creative and adapt. You have to get creative and adapt. Being complacent, isolating from your forever family, and not working your recovery is not an option. Why? Because the devil will attack. Listen to 1 Peter 5.8. It says, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to, to devour. Make no mistake about it. If you can't disconnect from the... You cannot disconnect from the very people that have been so critical in your recovery up to this point. You and I must get creative and adapt. One of the ways that we have adapted here at CR First NLR is we started having CR online. You're, you're watching it right now. And at first, it was very, very odd for me to communicate to an empty sanctuary. But after expressing my struggle, I was given some very helpful advice from someone that I admire and I trust very much. Now, when I speak into the camera, what I do is I picture, picture an actual person. And this is the person I picture. I picture a newcomer that is completely lost and doesn't know his or her way into recovery. And I speak directly to that person. It makes it easier then it becomes real for me. Although I might be a bit uncomfortable doing this, I adapt to doing something new. And that's the second key to working your recovery while, so while socially distancing. Don't be afraid to try something new. Get out of your comfort zone and just give it a try. Joshua 1.9 tells us, Have I not commanded you? Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The Lord is with you. You don't need to be fearful because he will walk every single step of the way with you. You know, we just started having open share groups on Zoom, which is an online video conferencing program. Now, this is brand new to all of us. And in our first few weeks, we've had to learn how to use it. And Frankly, um, we've had some glitches in terms of user friendliness and unfamiliarity. And, but it's been a blessing to almost every single person who's joined these groups. There was one person who was very resistant to using Zoom last Tuesday night. And I encouraged her. I said, listen, try it out. And she sent me th this message. And I need, need you to hear this. I'm glad I was in the group. It felt good seeing everyone and hearing their voices. Thanks for pushing me to participate. Yes, online open share groups are different. Um, they're brand new. However, you can't allow your level of comfort to interfere with your growth. I want to say that again. You can't allow your level of comfort to interfere with your growth. Remember what Philippians 4.13 says and apply it to every uncomfortable situation that you get in. It says you can do all things through Christ, even online open share groups, because he gives you strength. Now, it doesn't say online open share groups, but the point is you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Do you notice that it doesn't say, hey, you can do some things? Because Jesus will give you strength in some areas. No, it says you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Don't allow your level of comfort to interfere with your growth. Another way to work your recovery during this time of socially distancing is to serve others. By serving others, we're, we're taking the focus off of self and focusing on other people's needs. And 1 Peter 4.10 explains each of you should use whatever gift you receive to serve others and as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You see, you should use whatever gift God gives you. And 
all of us can serve in some way. That's a gift that God has given us. And this reminds me of a story that I read about a high school student in New York City. Yes, I said a high school student in New York City. On March 15th, Maeve Foley learned that public schools in New York City would be closed. The 17-year-old high school senior realized that she would likely complete her final year of high school from the comfort of her parents' home. And she still had several weeks until her online classes started. She was ridiculously bored. Does that sound familiar? I think many of us are ridiculously bored during these times. Well, Foley said, I really like being in school, and I really like helping people. I felt weird sitting around and not doing anything to help. Do you know, I think we all need to take on that mentality. It should feel weird to sit around and not help in some way. So here's what she did. She decided to post flyers around the neighborhood, offering to pick up groceries and prescriptions for anyone over the age of 65. She explained, I figured going to the store could be a scary situation for older people who might be at risk. I can't make a large-scale difference in terms of fighting this virus, but this seemed like something small that I could do. As I was hanging flyers, she says, a couple of complete strangers volunteered to join me. Now, here's what I want you to notice. First of all, when she got involved, she thought it was a small thing, and I want to argue that it was a very big thing for her to do that. That's a big deal for a teenager to do something like that. But here's the thing. What happened is when she made the decision to serve others, others joined her. And when you serve others, people notice, and they'll want to get involved. The Apostle Paul explained it this way in Acts 20, 35. He says, and I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. That's the reality. It is so much better to give than it is to receive. Maeve served as an example of how to serve others in need by working hard. I mean, she got off of the couch and she got into the game. I'm not sure if this young lady is a Christian, but her behavior indica- indicates to me that she has a very active, strong moral compass. And I'm certain she learned firsthand what a huge blessing it is to give rather than to receive. You know, I've seen several of you offering to help those who are at risk. And I applaud you for you for getting involved. There are many of you I've seen that are, are doing exactly what Maeve was doing, going and getting prescriptions for, for those who are elderly and those who can't get out of their homes, running and, and getting some, some supplies for them, getting them groceries. And there's a lot of people that need help. So I think we all, in fact, I don't think, I know we all need to get involved. So please do. However, Some of you may be saying this. You may be saying, Pastor Lane, I'm not going to risk getting the virus to help others. Listen to me. I don't expect you to be at risk. And some some of you should not put yourself in that position. But you can help. So here's a couple ideas of how you can help. First, you can, everybody can call someone. Pick up the phone and call people. Or you can video conference via FaceTime or Messenger on Facebook. Um, you, can, you can check in on them by, by texting. But, you know, I think texting is very unpersonal during these times. Call people that are involved in your open share groups. Or call friends from church. Call people from your work. Um, call people, if you're a student, call people in, in, from your school. Here's another idea, too, is call those people that maybe you haven't seen at Celebrate Recovery in in maybe days, months, or even in the last year or two. Let them know that you're thinking about them. Just pick up the phone. You know, we're all very comfortable, well, most of us, at calling our relatives. But calling other people is difficult. I want to challenge you to call somebody and encourage them. I've got to tell you, 
It encourages them. It, it, it brings a, a smile to their face. Every time I call somebody, the last thing they tell me is, thank you, Pastor Lane, for giving me a call. Another way that you can serve others is send encouraging emails or cards in the mail. Now, there are some folks that they, they, I've, I've actually had them tell me this. They say, Pastor Lane, it absolutely is something I can't do. I just can't call people on the phone. But I can send them a text or I can send them an email or a card in the mail. Now, I want to argue that I think the card in the mail idea is the greatest way to do it. Um, it's so impactful to receive an encouraging card. Um, just last week, I received a card here at church. And I got to tell you, that particular day, I was struggling in a mighty, mighty way. It was a, it was a tough, tough day. And do you know what? That card came at exactly the time that I needed it. It's amazing how God has that perfect timing, isn't it? And that card encouraged me. And the rest of my day, really, it turned around. When sending a card or email, make sure to include in encouraging scriptures. One of my favorites is Deuteronomy 12, 20, 12, 24. Um, listen to this, and, and, and it's very encouraging. It says, for the Lord your God is going with you. Just that in itself, the Lord your God is going with you is encouraging. But here's, what, here's the rest of the verse. It says, he will fight for you against your enemies and he will give you the victory. Make no mistake about it. Family, we are in a, a, war, a war zone right now. We're in a fight right now, aren't we? And the great news is we don't have to do this alone. The Lord is fighting for you. You don't have to go into this battle alone. And in fact, he's fighting this coronavirus. We don't have to be worried that, that this isn't going to... to, to work itself out because it will the lord is fighting for us that is encouraging news forever family you are not alone you know helping others it can also reduce your stress level and this if you if you have less stress guess what you're less likely to relapse so if you're healthy and you're in a position to safe, safely leave home i want you to be like mave and help deliver groceries and, and, and other necessities to high-risk people. If not, I want you to call people and, and send encouraging emails, texts, and cards. You know, we are all in this together, and there's no better time to step up and to give back to your community and give back to your forever family. Another wonderful way to work your recovery while social distancing is through Diet and exercise. Yes, I said it. Diet and exercise. The food that you eat and the physical activity will help you to feel better about yourself and your circumstances. Don't replace the keto diet, diet with the Cheeto diet and purposefully become less active. Um, no, replace unhealthy habits with good, healthy ones. Now, the coronavirus and resulting schedule and routine changes can cause an awful lot of stress and anxiety. I am on the phone every day with people in recovery who are experiencing incredible stress and incredible anxiety. Physical activity is important for everyone, no matter the age. Some, be some benefits of physical activity are overall better physical and even mental health. I want to share this real quick. It's not in my notes, but my father-in-law is 82 years of age, and he walks three miles every single day. You know, he's, he's more healthy than I am, I believe, and he wears the same size jeans that he did in college. Now, that's crazy. That's awesome. But that's because he watches what he eats, and he exercises every day. You know, adults who participate in 30 minutes or more of physical activity each day typically have better health throughout their lifetime. Physical activity has also shown to decrease your, your levels of stress. And living an active lifestyle encourages people to eat healthier. So I'm going to give you an example. Marcia and I, if any of you know us very well, you know that there, we go through these, these periods of eating and exercising. We just do. 
Um, and when we're eating healthy and when we're exercising, and by the way, we've started doing that recently, we feel better physically and our lives are far less stressful. In fact, I can handle stress much better. My mental health is better. And as I gain weight, here's the thing. I get more depressed at how I look. And the more depressed I get, the more that I eat unhealthy foods. And the more that I eat unhealthy foods, the worse I look and feel, and the more depressed I get. Y you see, it's, it's this, this cycle. It's just a super vicious cycle. And when I start eating better, I have the desire to exercise. And when I exercise, I have the desire to eat better. I, I begin this new healthy habit. Here's what's wonderful about it. When you do that, you start seeing results. You start feeling better. You start looking at food as more of fuel instead of just something you eat. And you start paying attention to those things that are going to give you more energy and that are, are going to contribute to your overall wellness rather than your particular taste for that moment. Now, I already know what you're thinking. You're saying, diets don't work, and I hate exercise. Listen, <laughs> I've got to tell you, I totally agree with you. Um, I really don't like diets. Diets don't work, but lifestyle change does. And if you don't like lots of exercise, here's what you want to do. Start taking walks. Be like my, my father-in-law. Start with a mile first, and then build up to a mile and a half or two miles. And then gradually, you'll get up to that three miles that, that he's walking. And if you do that daily, I promise you, it's going to change the way you feel. It'll give you more energy. You know, oftentimes when we're sitting on the couch, we say, oh, my goodness, I'm so tired. That's because you're not exercising. But you get off that couch, and you start walking, and suddenly you start having more energy. And then change your diet. I simply, this is what I did. I simply dropped eating sugar and bread for about the first three weeks. Now, I, right now, I haven't, I, I will, now I'll still have a little bit of sugar, and I'll have a little bit of bread. I periodically do it. So, for example, about every, every other day or every third day, I'll allow myself to have a slice of bread for breakfast. Sugar, I'll, I love ice cream, so I'm not going to not eat ice cream, but I plan those, those, those evenings where I'm going to have ice cream once or twice a week, and, and I have a, a small cup. Now it's become a healthy habit, and you know what's happened? I've lost 18 pounds, and I feel better, and my mental health has improved. Now I know you feel like you've just been on some kind of a health fitness commercial, but the reality is this will help you in your recovery. The more you take care of your body, the better that you, you feel. You know, do you realize that as a follower of Jesus, that your body is your temple? We are commanded to take care of our bodies. It's biblical. Listen to 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. It says, do, do you not know that you're God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Wow, I don't know about you. Those are really strong words from the one who created the temple that he resides in. And that's excellent motivation to take care of our bodies because God's spirit dwells in this body. I want it to be clean and healthy, and I want it to be a place that he's proud to dwell in. So take care of your body by becoming more, more physically active and eating a balanced, healthy diet. And after this crisis is over, your new, healthier lifestyle will become a regular part of your daily routine. You'll be starting replacing bad habits with a good one. One of the most critical ways to work your recovery while, while socially distancing is, this, is, this, is the same as when you're not socially distancing, which is, and you've heard me say this, attend more meetings. It's super important. 
Meet with people who understand what you're going through. You can't do this on your own. The Bible is clear on the importance of meeting together. This is Hebrews 10, 25. Listen to these words carefully. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I want to read that again. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another. How do you encourage one another? By your presence oftentimes. And I want you to know when you attend a meeting, you never know the person that God has preordained for you to meet in that meeting. And, and here's the thing. We're meeting online, and so you may say, well, how is that going? To, how am I going to meet somebody? When we're in these Zoom meetings, you're getting to see them face to face. And oftentimes, you're going to c- connect with them. And, and, and it's just a powerful thing. You're being an encouragement to one another. People in recovery like you and I are more at risk as our routines get disrupted and our lives are put on pause because of this corona, coronavirus crisis. The message we're receiving from the media today is the polar opposite of what we need to hear, right? It says stay away from people. Okay, we have to do that. We need to stay away from people physically. It, they're telling us to isolate. No, no, we don't need to isolate. We can still be in relationship with one another. If we don't connect with one another, we will relapse. It's not an if, it's a when. It's critical to take advantage of the opportunities that you have to stay in community. And I'm not suggesting that you go out and you meet people in person. I'm really not. I know there are some people that are doing that, and and honestly, I think that's probably pretty foolish. Instead, I want you to attend CR First NLR online. Now, if you're watching our service right now, you're attending large group, and I want to applaud that. That's a big deal. And if, you're, if this is your first time, welcome. Make this a regular part of what you do every single Tuesday night. In fact, here's what I'd also encourage you to do, is I would encourage you to invite people to, to go online with you and, and watch. I have seen families that are doing watch parties as they watch CR First NLR. You know what? Um, everything we say here, for the most part, is, is going to be, be consumable by most people at least 11 years and older, even when it's kind of tough content we're talking about. So the, the little kids, you can send them off in the, in the bedroom. But the, the kids that are getting into junior high, they can, they can certainly be a part of it. You know, I want you to, here's something when you think about being uncomfortable um, and, and coming onto these online groups. I want you to think about what it was like the first time you went to a recovery meeting, um, and it particularly celebra- CR, first NLR. It was hard. You probably didn't like it much. But over time, it became more bearable. And in fact, you began looking forward to attending. The same will happen when you, you start attending these online open share groups. It's going to be uncomfortable at first. Just plan on it. But it will help you to stay connected with your forever family and help prevent relapse. You know, sometimes medicine is not, it's kind of yucky to take, right? Sometimes attending groups isn't your favorite thing to do. But over time, when you see the benefits, you're going to look forward to showing up. And we have several opportunities for you to attend more open share groups. In addition to our Tuesday night groups, you can attend CR Metro on Friday nights. We have those groups at 7 p.m. You can attend CR Lono groups, which are on Sundays at 8.15 p.m. And I believe I'm also going to add an additional midweek pick-me-up like we used to have on Thursdays. Because we all need to get... uh, We need to continue to connect in relationship even though we're socially distancing. Ecclesiastes 4.19 through 12 is one of my favorite reminders of why recovery must be done in community. Listen to what it says. 
It says two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person fails, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two standing back to back can conquer. And three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Friends, we have to do this together. We can't do it alone. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much, God. We are so thankful that you have given us a program like this, CR First NLR. And we're, we're thankful that you, you have brought us together online, Lord. You know, sometimes we don't understand why these things happen in our lives. But Lord, we do know that you are in control. Lord, I pray for people as, as they, they get out of their comfort zone and they, they start doing some of these things that we've been talking about. They, they start serving one another. They, they start to connect with one another by picking up the phone and, and FaceTiming each other and sending letters and texts. And, and then those who start a new lifestyle of exercising and, and eating right, Lord. And I pray that, that they will continue to do those things. But here's what I'm most excited about, Lord, is that when they start realizing that doing this recovery thing in community is the only way to do it, and they get out of their comfort zone and, and de deter be become determined to continue to work their recovery, Lord. I know that you're going to help them work through every situation that they, they have that comes, comes in their way in the coming days, weeks, and months. Lord, we're praying for our nation right now. We're praying that this coronavirus will end soon. But God, until it does, help us to, to be in, in a, a community with one another and help us to connect in more intimate ways all the while social distancing. Jesus, we love you and trust you. And then friends, will you do me a favor? Will you join me in the serenity prayer? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, and trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Now, make sure that you join us for our secure online open share groups. And if you haven't already registered, there's an online form on, on our Facebook page. As soon as we finish with this large group, you simply need to go to that Facebook page, go ahead and click on that link and register and your leader will send you a link immediately so that you can join the groups. They'll start promptly at 8 p.m. You know, friends, CR is not a me program. It's a we program. Alone, you may falter, but together, we will conquer. We love you, have great groups, and we'll see you again next week.